Thanks, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to set my uh, timer here so that I don't run over um, because that would be a bad thing. All right. I don't know if I uh, need to do anything to turn myself on here. Uh, that sounded bad, <laughs> but I actually mean my slides. I'm going to talk with you tonight about um, the corporate control of information and why we should care. And I'm going to try to do that as quickly as possible. This is really a talk that deserves more time. And I'm ex so excited to be on this distinguished panel with these incredible um, makers and um, researchers as well. The thing that is so important to me and, and why I study corporate control over information, specifically Google, is because in many ways um, the, inf the, the public is increasingly reliant upon corporate provided information. And those contexts for that provision often happen um, by way of, of alleged neutrality or objective kinds of truth that might be provided by these kinds of platforms. Um, specifically, I study Google because Google really ha dominates the market. It's, a, it's not just a market leader, it holds a monopoly in the search space. And you know, when you think about it, if you're looking for information on the web and you don't know a specific URL, you are required to go through a broker, um, so to speak, or someone to help you find that kind of information that you might be looking for. And those brokers are search engines. And search engines, we relate to them in so many ways. If you look at the latest research, for example, it shows that um, the majority of the public in the United States believes that um, search engines are fair and unbiased sources of information. Um, they also think that the kinds of results that they get back, and you can look at kind of Pew Research, um, will tell you that people feel that um, this kind of information that they find in commercial search engines like Google is credible and trustworthy. And so this to me means that we have to t t pay close attention to what's happening in, t in those spaces. Now, some of you might be familiar with this campaign. This is one of the uh, more popular campaigns that has come about to try to problematize some of the kinds of things that we find in search engines. So this is a campaign that was uh, sponsored by the United Nations. And um, you can't read this, but I'll tell you. Um, uh, Ogilvy and Mather Dubai did a, a campaign that's a large advertising agency. They did searches on various women of color um, and in various countries to see what kinds of things Google would populate as an auto-suggest. And what they found, for example, were things like women cannot drive, be bishops, be trusted, speak in church. Women shouldn't have rights, vote, work, box. Women should stay at home, be slaves, be in the kitchen, not speak in church. Women need to be put in their places, know their place, be controlled, be disciplined. Now, this was a, you know, an interesting and, and fairly effective campaign in trying to point out that society holds still a whole lot of kind of sexist, patriarchal um, values around women. But what the campaign failed to do was really to contextualize why these kinds of results come up. It left most readers of the campaign believing that search engines are simply neutral. They're simply providing the uh, results that are most popular or most searched on. But I have found in my research, I've done quite a bit of research on uh, collecting searches, specifically on um, women and girls of color. What you find is that um, when you start to click on these kinds of auto-suggestions, they're linked to sites that are incredibly profitable for Google. They might be linked to, um, for example, and uh, uh, they might be linked to sites that are uh, uh, heavily um, populated by uh, keywords that are used through Google's AdWords program, right? So blogs or websites that heavily use AdWords. And so Google makes money on the kinds of traffic that happens in relationship to some of these searches. And I think this is one of the failings of a campaign to help us understand and make sense of this commercial as aspect, what the corporatization or the commercial aspects of information mean to an advertising company like Google. I often try to tell people that Google is not providing information retrieval algorithms. It's providing advertising algorithms. And that is a very important distinction when we think about what kind of information is available in these corporate controlled spaces. Now, 
Here's another example. Some of you might have seen this this summer. Um, a, a very well-known Black Lives Matter activist, D. Ray McKesson, tweeted, if you Google map um, the N-word house, this is what you'll find, America, right? His commentary. And what was happening in Google Maps this summer, um, many people um, noticed, is that if you were to go into Google Maps and search on the word, on the N-word house or the N-word king, Google Maps would take you to the White House. Now, the way that this was reported on by the media, um, the Washington Post kind of picking it up first and then others um, following, is that there must be some type of glitch in the system. And when we talk about these kinds of racist experiences um, and pointers that happen in technical systems, we also hear in the public discourse these things talked about, again, as anomalies, as glitches, rather than helping us to understand and unveil the ways that programmers are people who write code, and code is a language, and all languages are value-laden, including binary code language languages. So what this also tells us, even though Google gave a kind of apology, non-apology, um, kind of one of those, we apologize for any offense this may have caused. Um, I can tell you that when my husband says something like, I'm sorry if you're offended, that is not actually an apology. Um, so the non-apology apology, apology um, often comes forward from Google in these cases where they might even go so far as to issue a disclaimer um, about the kinds of problematic search results that come back. But again, the onus is typically placed back on the user that somehow you searched incorrectly. You might have, you, maybe you should have used different words. Um, never kind of, again, pointing to the host of decisions um, algorithmically that are made to get us to these kinds of pointers. And this is really important. Now, you can't see this. I don't know why it's been um, blocked out. Sorry, the image didn't come forward, but I'll tell you what happened here. You can see the main um, hit. I started collecting searches, for example, on um, the words black girls, Latina girls, Asian American girls, South Asian girls, um, indigenous girls, um, back in 2009. In 2009, the first hit when you did a search for black girls, and of course I, I was motivated by this partially because a colleague of mine, Andre Brock, had kind of mentioned we were talking about Google and some of the problematics, and he said, oh yeah, you should see what happens when you Google black girls. And I was like, what? I'm a black girl? Um, what happens when you search for black girls? And of course I have six nieces and a daughter, and, um, and what you would have seen here would, would be um, a list of uh, highly pornographic and sexual um, results. So the first one, um, the first hit in 2009 was hotblackpussy.com. By 2011, that site had gone um, underway and um, sugaryblackpussy.com really dominated the landscape as the first hit when you looked for black girls. Now let me say that again, where the bias is, is that you didn't have to search for black girls and sex or black girls and porn. Black girls metaphorically meant sex and porn as did Latinas and Asian girls and so forth. Um, white girls didn't fare too much better, also were sexualized. And then the term girls um, really being co-opted in a, in a very sexism 101 way because all of these sites, as you click down them, were not girls. They were not children. They were not adolescents. They were women, grown women. And so we have to kind of look at these examples and say again, what does it mean? Now, I wrote about this, I first tried to write about this for Essence Magazine, which is a magazine that focuses on um, women of color, and um, they wouldn't have it because who are you? I don't know who you are, right? I mean, you can't write for a major um, news outlet when you're virtually unknown. So um, I thought I'd write this, this article for the public, and um, I contacted Bitch Magazine. They're a, a progressive kind of feminist magazine that critiques um, society and um, culture. And um, I couldn't convince them, in fact, to let me write this article. They were like, everybody knows when you search for girls, you're going to get porn. And I was like, do they? So um, I, you know, I said, OK, but th this is problematic. Again, how, how girls become um, stand-ins for pornography, right? And who and how that kind of sexualization. And you can see a mapping of, if you look in the kind of porn studies literature, you can see a mapping of the racial hierarchy as well of this kind of um, more violent forms of um, pornography and sexualization as you go through kind of a racial order in the United States. Um, 
Eventually, I, I told Bitch after about 10 emails, I said, listen, why don't you do a search for women's, for women's magazines? And then let me know if you find Bitch in the first five pages. And then I got the story. So <laughs> the thing is, is that they understood, finally, that the concept of feminism had been divorced from women. And so it's really important to talk about concepts, how concepts get framed algorithmically. And um, this is a really important part of, of my work, um, and I've written about this. I've actually got a book um, now that'll be forthcoming next year called Algorithms of Oppression, and it's really to kind of elucidate how these processes happen. Now, um, quickly, it's not just a matter of representation and misrepresentation, pornification, because that's incredibly important, but there are other nuanced ways in which algorithmic bias is happening. So here you have an article in Forbes, that uh, a, a negative article that was written against a study um, by Epstein and Robertson, where they found that, um, that voter preferences could be manipulated quite easily um, based on the kinds of results that showed up on a first page of search. So if negative stories about a candidate, especially at the local level, circulated on the first page of search, people voted against them. If positive stories circulated on the first page, people voted for them. And those things are highly manipul manipulable. One of the things that uh, Matthew Hinman, for example, wrote about in um, his book, The Myth of Digital Democracy, is this notion that um, what we find in these online per, uh, news environments in particular is just a matter of kind of unbiased uh, free flow of information. He found in his re research studying elections that um, people who had the most money were able to influence what showed up in the first pages. And so this, this political economic kind of critique of what happens, the first page of search is so incredibly important because the majority of people don't go past that. And so what happens there is, is highly contested and something that we must pay close attention to. Now, this is one of the last things I wanna share um, that I re recently wrote about. Um, and this is, the, again, to talk about and elucidate the way that concepts get formed and knowledge gets created and knowledge biases happen. So the, Dylan Rimstorf is a um, avowed white supremacist who opened fire on um, a church in South Carolina this summer and murdered in cold blood nine African American worshipers. And um, this is an excerpt from his manifesto that was found um, online. And um, I, I want to kind of draw attention to a couple of things that are really important. So he says, um, the event that truly awakened me was the Trayvon Martin case. I kept hearing and seeing his name and eventually I decided to look him up. I read the Wikipedia article and right away, I was unable to understand what the big deal was. It was obvious that Zimmerman was in the right. But more importantly, this prompted me to type in the words black on white crime into Google and I have never been the same since that day. The first website I came to was the Council of Conservative Citizens. There were pages upon pages of these brutal black on white murders. I was in disbelief. And then he goes on to talk about how could this be happening. And so he talks about researching um, even more and, and this affirming his commitment to white supremacy. And he says, through all this research, which we can gather, much of this happened online through Wikipedia and Google, he says, from here I can find, um, from here I found out about the Jewish problem and other issues facing our race, and I can say today that I am completely racially aware. Now, it's not a far-fetched to know and think that many people are coming into their kinds of various forms of consciousness, not just racial consciousness, through the use of these kinds of platforms. What doesn't happen when you go, and for example, if you look at the Council of Conservative Citizens, um, the Council of Conservative Citizens is a cloaked website. Jesse Daniels writes about cloaked websites, websites that pretend to be a neutral kind of media or objective site, but are in fact are doing something different. The Council of Conservative Citizens has a website that just looks like a conservative media aggregator that's feeding out news, but it's actually um, a, a very well-documented white supremacist organization. It's like the businessman's KKK um, and has been for a long time. And so. What Dylan Roof didn't get when you do searches um, like black on white crime is you don't get a counterpoint, for example, that says there's no such thing as black on white crime. You don't get FBI statistics that, that uh, disprove the concept of black on white crime. You don't get uh, uh, information from um, black studies scholars, for example, that might talk about what a framing of a question like black on white crime even means 
in the context of contemporary American society. And so these are some of the things that I think um, I'm doing in my research to try to, again, make us aware of the critical importance of what these um, corporate controlled um, information environments are about. And I would just say that big data technology biases, they don't just end in our kind of first world US, Western, global north um, context. Much of my work for the past few years has been about Google and misrepresentation, certainly, but if you want to extend the kinds of biases that happen in terms of political and economic policy, you can see the number of companies that are implicated in things like the extraction and mining industries, where you have some of the worst um, political sexual violence happening in direct relationship to the extraction of minerals that we need for our electronics, for our technologies, right? Again, these things are hidden from view. We also don't see the incredible e-waste, the e-waste cities that are popping up along the west coast of um, Africa and Ghana, incredibly toxic um, uh, situations where people are literally exchanging their lives in many ways in the extraction and in the waste um, industries, hidden from view. So we have to think again about in what ways are our fetishes around um, technology implicated in um, these kinds of more um, inhumane situations for other people around the world. And I'll leave it there and I look forward to um, talking with you during the Q&A.